Section 5 of Astounding Stories, 19, July 1931. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Kilmer, San Antonio, Texas. Astounding Stories, 19, July 1931. The Hands of Aten by H. G. Winter, Part 3. But the action helped them but little, and added only a few feet to the distance between them and their pursuers, for they boldly made the deep drop without sending for another ladder. Taya was sobbing for air, and Wes himself beginning to feel the bitter pang of hopelessness when they rounded a corner and came to a great chasm, a wide cleft in the very heart of the volcano. A terrific heat came from its maw of unbroken black and a peculiar choking odor sulfurous. Across it was a slender framework of hides and thongs, a mere catwalk over the terrible depths below. You first, Craig snapped, and as Taya started across, a spear came hurtling from the mob behind and clanked against the rocky wall on the far side. Nimbly, Taya sped over the bridge, and Wes, the yells of Herhor and his men loud in his ears, followed. Midway, a long spear snaked after him. It missed by inches and went pitching into the gulf. In his haste, he caught his foot on the interlaced thongs, stumbled, and almost fell, which saved his life, for another spear streaked through the very spot where he had been a second before. Then he was across, and his sword was flashing in vicious hacks at one of the two main supporting thongs of the bridge. The hide was tough, but Craig's strength was that of a desperate man, and in several mighty strokes he severed it. The framework slumped to one side, held only by one thong. Here Hor, half across, croaked in sudden horror and sprang back as he saw the stranger raise his blade to carve through the other support. But even as the sword swept down, a spear streamed from a warrior's hand and thudded against Wes's right shoulder. His sword jarred loose. It fell into the chasm. Thou art hurt, cried the girl. Wes grinned wryly. Nay, he said, but weaponless. Lead on. They were now on the other side of the chasm, in the tunneled volcano. The priests had hesitated a moment when the bridge had slackened, but now, seeing the weaponless man and girl disappear in a tortuous corridor ahead, they sidled across the damaged catwalk after their fierce leader. They will go past the temple, here Hor shrilled. It is Taya who leads him. Again she tries to escape to the land of ice. Follow, up here. His words were true. The corridor that led by the temple was the one which led to the only passage up to the crater of the volcano. But Taya had guided Craig only a few steps past the place of worship, now a silent vault of impenetrable blackness, when, turning a corner, the American felt her shrink back. Shabako comes, she told him faintly. Quickly he verified it. Led by the pharaoh himself, a party of soldiers was coming down the corridor some thirty yards away. Even as Wes saw them, they saw him, and Shabako's roar of sudden alarm tingled his ears. Priests behind, soldiers, and the blood-lustful pharaoh ahead. They were cut off, blocked, trapped. There was no nearby branch passage to run down. There was no way to turn. It was the end of the game. But no, not quite. Craig told himself grimly. His sword was gone, but his fists would tell on them before he went down, before the paws of the idol finally claimed him. He stepped before Taya, clenched his fists, and waited the shock of the charge. He could see the fury in Shabako's narrowed eyes, so close were they, when a soft hand pulled him back. It was Taya's. Come, she whispered and darted swiftly back to the gloomy, shadow-filled entrance of the temple. And wondering, Wes Craig followed. 
she glided through the pillared portal and was immediately swallowed up by a shroud of silent, velvety darkness. Wes could not see her, but her soft hand touched his arm lightly to guide him forward, and he sensed the girl's warm body close to his. Where was she going? Inevitably, they would be trapped in the far end of the temple, beneath the very hands of the idol, or so he thought. But he trusted her and went on. A shout came from the entrance. They went in here, someone cried, and the two heard Shabako's detailing swift instructions to his men, instructions which were cut short by another clatter of feet and the approaching voice of Herhor. Priests and soldiers had joined, a confusion of men, most of them hanging back, half afraid to venture into the well of blackness that was Aten's abode on earth. But the pharaoh whipped them into discipline with the harsh tones of his voice, and strung them into a close line to advance slowly through the temple. Have thy blades ready, he added. They cannot escape us now. They are trapped. Forward. Nothing could get through that line. It was like a fine-toothed comb, with every tooth a man. Craig saw it coming, and knew that he and the girl could not go much farther back, for already he sensed himself directly beneath the looming figure of Aten. Yet the gentle touch led him on, around and past the idol, into the furthermost corner of the temple. It was then that Taya paused, felt around, and placed Craig's right hand upon some unseen knob in the wall. Her faint whisper hurriedly explained the purpose of the knob as West drank in her words eagerly. There is a secret room behind the idol from whence the priests ape the god's voice and move his hands at sacrifice. A priest should be there even now, ready for the ceremony. Thou must overcome him, divine one, and we too can hide therein. Herhor, dare not search for us there while others are present, for even Shabako knows not of the room. Quick, then, they come. Thy hand is on the latch of the secret panel. I follow thee. West pressed the girl's hand tightly, and his body tensed. Then, without hesitation, he jerked the secret panel back. A faint glow of light lay ahead, and he plunged into the tiny room that lay revealed. An alarmed face stared up. The priest. West leaped at him, his steely fingers thumbing into the man's throat and throttling its scream to a gasping choke. All the American's pent-up fury went into a lunge that the priest could not begin to stand against. He was bowled sharply over and went down, Craig on top, and there the fight ended as suddenly as it had begun. The priest's head thudded into the smooth rock floor. A convulsion quivered his body. He moaned and lay still. A grim flicker in his eyes, Craig got up and looked around for Taya. Then astonishment and cold fear swept through him. The secret door was closed, but she was not inside. Now what? Wesley Craig gasped. He did not dare finish the thought. He glared around the room, much as a trapped tiger does, his brain a turmoil. His eyes fell on a ladder that led up from the floor to a niche in the left wall. A slit about forty feet high, a pool of darkness shadowed from the thin tongue of flame that lit the room. Only half realizing what the slit was, Wes sprang forward and leaped up the ladder. A platform was built high up inside the niche, a place for a man to stand on. The American reached it, pressed himself forward, and peered through a tiny hole that was in the rock ahead. He knew it ought to command a view of the temple. But if it did, Craig could see nothing, for there was no light in the huge vault outside. For minutes the brooding silence was not broken, save by an occasional scraping sound made by one of the searching line of men. There was no hint of the girl who waited beside the hideous figure of the god, nor of the network that gradually closed in on her. But suddenly the silence was shattered by a shout. I have her, someone yelled. Then came a multitude of sounds. The piercing voice of Herhor was audible above them all. Light the lamps, hast thou the other two? 
Nay, he is not here. Not here? What? A spark of light made an erratic course from the temple door. Someone was bringing a flame to light the lamps. A moment later, there was a flare of yellow light as the oil in a large wall lamp caught fire, and then the darkness melted further before a wave of light from the opposite wall. Now could be seen the warriors, who, with gleaming, outdrawn swords, were clustered around the girl. Shabaka was gripping her arm and shaking her roughly. The high priest was drawing to a stop before her, to stand, glaring at her with hate-inflamed eyes. "'Tell us,' roared the pharaoh, "'where is the man?' She looked at him levelly. Her eyes were quite calm, and she breathed evenly. There was a glorious light in her eyes as she replied. "'I will tell thee,' she said, "'though thou will not comprehend. He vanished, vanished even as a god. He was here beside me in the darkness, and then suddenly he was gone. But why not? For he was a god. The soldiers gaped at her. Silence came down in the temple. The high priest did not break it, but only stared closely at the girl with eyes that suddenly had something more than hate in them, comprehension and a trace of fear. But the pharaoh Shabako's eyes were only wrathful, and he shouted, A god? Vanished, sayest thou? Lies, lies! But thou canst not lie to Aten. The god knows of a way to loosen thy tongue. Despite herself, Taya shuddered. She knew that way. Gradually the temple was filling with other worshippers come to see the sacrifice, and soon there were sixty or seventy of them. The men outnumbered the women two to one, and none of them was very old. Fifty was about their age limit, and those who were near this age were reluctant to let their eyes rest on the hands of the idol. When they did glance at them, and at the cruel knife blade in the upper one, fear showed on their face. There were also very few children. Here horse thin features grew unreadable in the coldness that settled upon them. He was now in the role of high priest, apart, separate from the common mob before him, interpreter of Aten's divine mysteries, playing his part of one who listened to a god's awful whisperings. Impassively, he superintended it, the binding of Taya by a priestess, who tightened the cords around the girl's slim body with claw-like hands, a gleam of unholy anticipation on her fleshless, soured face. Then the high priest turned from the altar and faced the crowd of people. Silence, he commanded, silence before thy god Aten. A hush fell instantly. Their eyes centered on the bound figure of the girl, standing just beside the lowermost hand of the idol that would presently claim her. Her face was very pale, but none could detect fear in it. There was an uneasy stir, a shifting of feet, a mumbling, as her fresh young beauty struck the watchers. Somewhere a man muttered that she was very young to die. Aten had returned her once. Perhaps the god did not wish her to perish. His neighbor demurred, and the ceremony went on. Ornate, but crude censers were in the hands of two priests. The incense was lit by long tapers, and its acrid odor wound up in wavering purple spirals of smoke. On each side of Herhor were five under-priests, eyes stiffly on their superior's impassive face. The soldiers had retreated from the altar, and now were massed in the rear of the temple, their spear-blades glittering dully above their heads. The high priest raised his hand slowly and stared with glazed eyes into the gloom of the ceiling high above. Praise, he shrilled, praise to Aten. The assembled worshippers joined him in the chant of sacrifice. It was low and soft, and at first almost drowsy, like the slow stir of a tropical wind through the palm leaves. But soon it quickened with rising tones from perfectly concerted voices. It soared up, its tenor changed, it became fierce, lustful, eager for blood, eager for the sacrifice, a heathen chant, shrilling, for sight of a girl's body in the god's awful hands. 
and it died in a sad, discordant moan on an expectant note. Here Hor's body, stiff and rigid in its ceremonial robes, did not seem human as he stretched his arms straight forward and wheeled silently to the huge idol of stone. A full two minutes he stood without so much as flickering an eyelash. Then, not shifting his glazed stare, he harshly intoned, Ages ago our ancestors set out from the homeland of Egypt in a great galley, bound for the barbarian countries of the north in quest of metal. But storms seized upon them, drove them far from their course, till at last, weak from hunger, they came to this land of ice, where their galley was wrecked and they were cast ashore. At first all was dark, then came the sun god, Aten's life-giving rays, leading them to this mountain, which they inhabited, and in which they carved this temple, wherein to worship the god who had saved them. The lord of the galley was the first pharaoh. The priest of the galley was called high priest. The pharaoh took a concubine to wife, and thus our civilization begun. There were versions of the temple, holy, set apart from man, sacred to Aten. Never did one betray her sacred trust, never, until Taya fled to the land of ice with the sacrilegious Inaros. Our mighty pharaoh pursued them, and after twenty years, by Aten's special grace, slew the man and brought the maid back to pay for her transgression. Never before has this happened. He paused, waiting. An underpriest spoke, evidently following some ritual. Here is the priestess, O high priest of Aten. What penalty must she pay? Death in Aten's hands, the cold voice shrilled instantly. The god wills it. But now came an interruption, unexpected and disconcerting to the well-laid plans of Herhor. The voice of Pharaoh Shabako cried out. Another came with his priestess, a blasphemous stranger. He lies concealed. The maid will not tell where. High priest, let her be tortured in Aten's hands until she reveals where he is. For a moment, Herhor lost his mask-like rigidity of expression. His eyes shifted nervously. But Shabako was not to be denied. Again he repeated his demand. We must pray to Aten to make his hand descend upon her, prick and gash her, till she divulges. A murmur arose from the people in the temple. They approved the torture. Herhor, obviously reluctant, was forced to comply. O oh, mighty Aten, he cried, turning to the idol, thou hast heard our pharaoh. We pray to thee to lay thy hand upon the priestess Taya, till she tells where the stranger lies concealed. Shabako nodded in approval. While a mumbled prayer rose, Four priests strode to the girl, lifted her slight form, and flung it on the upturned lower hand of the idol. They strapped her there securely, her breast but ten feet below the waiting knife. Even then she did not struggle or cry out. She did not know who had won the fight inside the secret room. But her heart told her it was the mysterious stranger. For was he not a god? She would not be afraid for he would surely reveal his divinity and save her, even as he had, from her twenty-year death, and from her bonds in the cell where they had been imprisoned. The softly chanted prayer surged through the temple. Here Horace's slitted eyes were on the knife in the upper palm of the idol. Suddenly he flung up his arms and cried, Now, O Aten! The prayer stopped. With fearful interest the people stared at the dagger, at the inert figure of the girl, the more elderly, seeing in her a hint of what was to come to them when their days of service were ended. The knife started downward. Taya's eyes were closed. Her breathing was even and regular. She did not seem at all aware of the shaft of steel that slowly, in the hushed gasp from the audience, stirred with a stone hand that held it and moved deliberately downward. To the silent crowd of worshippers, it was a religious phenomenon, and well calculated to strike fear and awe into their hearts. The moving idol 
seemed to be a living thing, motivated by the unseen spirit of the god it represented, who caused the massive upper hand to execute his will. Its movement was slow and clumsy, and close listeners would have heard a slight creaking noise from somewhere behind it. But the ears of the worshippers were deaf from the fear and the horror in which they were vicariously participating. Slowly the hands came together, until the long, wicked shear was but a foot above the bound girl. It dropped to within inches of her flesh. And there it stopped. Then, before the amazed crowd could realize what was happening, before even Herhor could control the surprise that raised his brows incredulously, the palm in which the blade was implanted slowly retraced its course and returned to its original position. A breathless silence reigned in the temple. The hand was motionless. It did not stir again. The god will not touch his priestess. It was a faint, awed whisper that came from someone amongst the worshippers. But Herhor heard it, and so did the other priests. While they stared at each other, utterly at a loss, the whisper was taken up and repeated on all sides. The god will not touch his priestess. The high priest sensed the crowd's conviction and sensed them turning against him. His beady eyes glanced around nervously, his lips a thin line. He called to a second-ranking priest in a tense whisper and, when the other came to him, muttered in his ear, "'Tis the stranger hiding in the secret chamber who does this. He has overcome our brother there and now controls the levers, and Taya knows it, and if she reveals it to the people, our hold will be broken. She must be killed. Yes, but how? We must be quick. Herhor's crafty face set cruelly. I know a way. Watch thou. He strode to the fore of the altar and flung his hands high. A shrill shout from his thin lips cut the uneasy murmuring short. Hearken! Aten will not torture his own priestess. He will not maim those who have sworn their lives to him. The silent crowd waited for his next words. He screamed savagely. His high priest must perform the rite. Aten has appointed me to be his instrument of vengeance. A gleam of unholy exultation was in his narrowed eyes. His face worked. He thrust a hand inside his ornate ceremonial vestment. By divine will, he cried, this knife in my hand is the knife in the god's hand. And he whipped a long blade from the robe. Never before had such a ceremony been held in the temple of Aten, the sun god. Never before had the hand of the god paused above the living sacrifice and deliberately risen again without tasting blood. It was miracle upon miracle. Half bewildered, Pharaoh Shabako and the herd of common people alike waited for what would come next, their high priest's savage words somewhat reassuring them that all was correct. They saw him clench his dagger tightly and with slow steps advance to the side of the helpless girl. Glaring down at her, he swung the blade high. It poised directly over her heart. It would not torture her. Taya knew it was death that she read in the high priest's eyes. She closed her own and thought of the stranger. She breathed a silent prayer to him. She waited. In Aten's name, screamed Hehor, and brought the dagger down. End of section five.